recordings are available now for us to listen to. He just made little personal recordings uh, on a one-off basis yeah. for friends and family and people that were really interested. I think in the early days, as far as anyone can remember, it was just a novelty of hearing himself sing to start with and he really got into the idea of trying to get the perfect performance down on tape. Uh -huh. But when his friends, who appreciated the singing so much, heard what he was doing, they started to ask if they could get copies. I talked to one guy who spent the equivalent of several months' wages on a real through machine just so he could hear Thomas's tapes. Yeah, and that's how it started, wasn't it? It was like when electrification hit, uh, arrived in Shetland, was that the late 50s? Uh, on Borough it was 53. 53, was early 50s. Different dates for different places, yeah. but 53. So his first thing was, oh great, that means I can record my stuff, is it as yeah. instantaneous as that? Yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. and on, I can't remember which of the CDs, but there's a couple of tracks dating right back to 53. Coincidentally, yeah. of course, the year Hank Williams died. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. So uh, we hear Hank for the last time, then and we And then Thomas we start the hearing time. Thomas for the first time, yeah. Uh, it's a fa uh, it is a fantastic story, and uh, uh, as you say yourself, I think the charm of the actual ori original recordings is, for me, uh, having listened to some genius musicians through throughout the ages, but with Thomas, there was no ulterior motive apart from the enjoyment of the songs, yeah. is there? I think that's the, yeah, like, you're the lasting right. charm. He had no interest in commercial success, yeah. he had no interest in fame and celebrity, quite the opposite. Yeah. All he was interested in was pouring his heart out into these songs. And so both in the choice of the songs he sings, but also the way he performs them with such passion. Yeah. You know, it's 100% yeah. and adulterated sincerity. You know, one of the reasons we like country music is because of its sincerity. I got a feeling called the blues Oh Lord, kiss my baby, say goodbye Ain't I do know what I do All that you to say and cry Oh Lord, my last long day to say goodbye Hear the Lord, I thought I would cry she do me, she do you, she got the kind of love him. Hell, I love to meet her when she calls me every day. Hey, Eddie, what a beautiful dream. I hate to think it's all over. I lost my heart, it seems. Yeah, baby. I've grown so used to you somehow. And I'm nobody here, but daddy knows I got a love. I got a little thing blue. But, uh, you know, half the time, especially these days, yeah. it's fake sincerity, you know. <laughs> okay, to get a big hit, you've got to be sincere. Yeah. Nice. Okay, yeah. I'll work that, I'll work on that. Yeah. Whereas here's the real deal. Yeah, so, so let's talk about uh, actually you're picking up on the story and bringing it to the stage, really. How did that all come about? Um, well, uh, as you may remember, my uh, main musical love is Texas Swing, mm -hmm. Western Swing, Bob Wills, Milton Brown, Adolf Hoffman, people yeah. like that. And I've written about that in the past, and uh, after having been to Texas a few times... Yeah, and the book is a fantastic travel log of... of I just... Yeah, you went on a voyage... Bob Wills, yeah. Yeah, I travelled around trying to find, tracking down where he was born, yeah. where he grew up, musicians who played with him, yeah. dance halls he played yeah. in, the whole story. Yeah. Of course, these days, with the internet, you could you Google could. it and you'd find it all in about five minutes. <laughs> but I spent three months driving around Texas, yeah. wandering you know, into the old farmhouses going, is this where Bob was lived? No, it was five miles that yeah. way. Yeah. But of course, I got a real good feel for the country yeah. doing it that way. Yeah. Anyway, um, I've written a few plays over the years, uh -huh. you know, including one a couple of years ago for the National Theatre, a translation of a Belgian play, uh -huh. uh, a, a dark, disturbing psychological horror story. 
So uh, I have written plays um, about various things, but the National Theatre actually got the idea, or, or they caught wind somehow, they, they read a brief mention in a newspaper article about this guy Thomas Fraser, who'd lived in Shetland and been a great singer. Thomas Fraser, Thomas Fraser, <laughs> 1927, 1978, from <laughs> Shetland, recorded to me like, so and after about 10 minutes, he you know, thought, okay, you've answered my question, you would be interested in writing a show about it. Uh -huh. So, um, I'd just been a fan up to then, you know, yeah. trying to listen to you, I hadn't thought about writing yeah. anything. I said, well, the first thing I want you to do is go up to Shetland and talk to the family, because if they're happy with the idea, then I'm happy. If they were dead set against it, then it would be a bit tricky to do it, really. I wouldn't really want yeah. to. But luckily, Carl and May were very encouraging. Not just in that they agreed to be interviewed with me several times, uh -huh. but also they didn't ask for any kind of control or yeah. e they didn't even ask to see the script. They trusted that I was going to treat their father, grandfather, you know, with respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, ha we were very nervous the first night in Orkney because they came to the family came to see it that night. Uh, luckily, they liked it. Turned out they were even more nervous than we are because they had no idea what we were going to say. Yeah. We could have said anything, yeah. but they approved, so... Uh. Well, uh, well, well done to everybody, and, uh, and all... The legacy, I mean, it's, uh, it's alive, it's out there, people are playing the records and uh, talking about Thomas yourselves doing this, but it's also alive in Shetland, isn't it? I mean, and, and we don't really know what the, the influence is from Shetland. Uh, I, I tend to think it's substantial. I tend to think that uh, I, the, particularly the Scottish love of country music uh, has a lot to do with the fact that Thomas got on the case so early uh -huh. and started pollinating all these musicians up in Well, Shetland. I think that pollination is now onto a second generation. When yeah. he did it himself, it was obviously two a few dozen people yeah. probably who heard him and received his tapes. But thanks to the work that Carol has done yeah. uh, and others in the, in the Thomas Fraser Committee, mm -hmm. um, well, now it's, I don't know, thousands, yeah. 10,000, 20,000 CDs. Yeah. And uh, so Thomas's voice and example is spreading yeah. further and wider than ever before. And I think you'll be forever uh, great, grateful and astounded by the fact that all the people, I mean, I was up at the f uh, festival a couple of years ago and Rick McWilliams was there, who's the last uh, descendant of of uh, Jimmy Williams. Rogers, Elsie yeah. McWilliams, who wrote uh, Jimmy's yeah. big hits as well, direct descendant of him as well, and they now make the pilgrimage back. Uh, uh, El Scruggs' uh, nephew's coming back this year. And That's right, Chris Scruggs. Yeah. yeah, so it's amazing, and it's a great yes, testament uh, to them. I think, you know, there's been a lot of Scottish singers of country music, and mm -hmm. you know, some, of them, some of them have been very good. But Thomas went beyond all that. He digested. He took all the music into yeah. himself. He digested it. He made it his own. You know, yeah. and, and that originality and um, the sincerity, the genuineness of it, the authenticity of it, really comes over. Yeah. And I guess that's what folk in the states recognise. Yeah. Well, we we won't say too much about the story because people should come and see the play. And you're going on with the play. Uh, I mean, I know this is the second last night on this Scottish leg of it, but you're taking it onwards to, to Borough, to, uh, yeah. back to his home as well. Yeah, we're going up to Shetland in November to do the show just before the Thomas, well, at the start of Thomas Fraser Festival, yeah. and we're performing at each of the concerts as well, yeah. which we're really looking forward to. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm going to have to change the script a bit, because there's a lot in the script about telling people what Borough's like. You can hardly say a lot when we're standing in Borough. That's true. And then we're going to go to Glasgow in January yeah. to... Uh, Celtic Connections, we'll be doing it at the Tron Theatre there. Fantastic. And, you know, for us as a band, the Lone Star Swing Band, we've yeah. been playing around Orkney for more than 10 years now, but uh, we hardly ever play outside Orkney. Uh -huh. The great thing about working with the National Theatre of Scotland is they've set up the tour, they've got us to places we would never have got yeah. to. Yeah. And who knows where we'll go after that. You know, the plans seem to be afoot to do it further into the future, which should be very exciting. Well, fantastic. And the show all finishes with your band playing... 
uh, who are we at the end sometimes? Uh, yeah, uh, just to, apart from when we've been in kind of fixed seat theatres, we've done that every night. And yeah. every night we've got people up dancing. Fantastic. Well, sometimes I... they're dancing to strip the wall, sometimes they're dancing to take me back to Tulsa. <laughs> well, I'll be one of those dancing tonight yeah. anyway. Thank you very much, Duncan. It's Thank a you. real pleasure talking to you. I'm in love, I'm in love with a beautiful girl. That's what's the matter with me. I'm in love, I'm in love with a beautiful girl, but she don't care about me. I tried and I tried, 